system that we gave to the sheriff's office. And when I met with um, Captain Hunter, sheriff, et cetera, we talked about, I asked them, what about when someone needs treatment? What, how do you keep the phone numbers in the reference? And I, I had my handy dandy um, brochures with me that day, as I always do. And I put these out. And they kind of looked at me like, that might not be so convenient with an naloxone kit. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, they, they kind of went, like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I said, so you carry those around? Oh. Um, and then out of that discussion, they said, well, get something small that was laminated that we could put with the kit. So we did develop these, but then we became aware in the last week that if we made these available to everybody for different issues, it does have three critical phone numbers, at least that the Mental Health and Recovery Board funds. So on the back you have the crisis line, which is at the counseling center, which has traditionally been um, dangerous to self and others, those kind of issues. But then we also have 180 and Anazal, their phone numbers on here, so that it's a smaller card that you can keep and use. Um, we've reordered already because we've decided to share these with some of you. And then Captain Hunter distributes them um, with the naloxone to all the officers in Wayne County, so we'll have to reorder to even get more of those in, but wanted you to know that. The other thing, and I did give you several pieces of paper, I won't go through all of those. Um, there are the new limits on prescription opiates that came out from the governor, just a reminder about that. And since Jerry and I are both mental health recovery boards, I'll use my name so that you remember it more. But, um, we we have a flyer that comes out each month, and this one's on the opiate epidemic, moving from the spirit of hope. It has some very relevant information, data. It's it's good for you to have a lot of this, and it talks about the hope for treatment, which is our piece of the pie. So it talks a lot about that. It also talks about the number of providers needed that we have at the very bottom of the page, current rate of opiate dependence in the state of Ohio is one every, out of every hundred people. But there's enough, or the state only has enough treatment providers for one in 50. So that tells you kind of the battle that we're up against. And then kind of a key point of today, I passed out a resolution and our state association has asked that our boards look at passing a resolution which our board discussed last night and a resolution to essentially say that we recommend, we realize it's not an epidemic and it's going to be one, and I'm going to read just the last half, part of the last sentence, but after the therefore it be resolved, prioritizing the needs of Ohioans impacted by opioid addiction by dramatically increasing investments in prevention, treatment, recovery, support, education, and interdiction efforts to this in this epidemic. So I'm recommending, as most reports in Ohio, is that the opiate task force, we can change the blank. We left the sample one that was on there from the um, president of our association, but we would change the blank and put in opiate task force and ask that the opiate task force, we have a separate one for our board, and we would get that to you. And I would ask that we authorize um, leadership of the opiate task force. I'm on the executive committee, but authorize the leadership to sign that we're in support of that. I know we haven't traditionally done resolutions and first and second, so however, we want to decide to do that. Um, so that's kind of all I've got for today. Oh, the city would be willing to also. Thank you. And in fact, and I can send out uh, electronic copies that we can work on. We're open and, and thank you because I was the one that recommended it at the executive committee that we not only have the local board do it, but and because you're doing it with our task force, but make it a little bit more all of our organizations. Because all of you are dealing with, whether it's the county commissioners, whether it's um, health department, you know, everyone is dealing with this. children's services, we're working very closely, and everybody to pass it. And then at the opiate conference in Columbus, and I'll give you the sneak preview on that date, it's June 12th and 13th, Monday and Tuesday, double check that on the calendar. 
um, and I brought it, so I'll pass it around too, that um, at the opiate conference at the state level, then um, we would be having a press release about the importance of this. And I, I know a resolution doesn't change everything, but it states that we're all together and we're working against this epidemic and that we're trying to conquer. So thank you very much. That was one of the critical points. Thank you. Okay, back to the city. Thank you. And I'll get out some electro, I'll send it out through Kyle, the elect a cleaner electronic version that sure. folks could use. Thank you. I have a question. It would be wonderful if we could get some of these cards and we would put those in our project on kits. Thank you. And what I'll do also is anybody that wants to send me an email, but I'll also send out a note through Kyle that now that we're, we've just reordered, and I suspect I'll be reordering again tonight because several of you have been telling me how you'll use these, and CSB has let us know that they would use them at their upcoming breakfast. And it's just in place of a full brochure. It's a couple of phone numbers that you might be handy. I gave these out to some board members. Um, one board member came back last night and said, could I have three more? He said, I used all mine. And he actually took somebody to two of our agencies. So they, and he said, I gave him a card. I don't have it anymore. <laughs> and the agency saw the person, the one person within the same day. I appreciate that. And then the only thing other I could say is I thought Don Hall needed just recognized quality for the office. Excuse me, Judy, you mentioned that everybody is fighting against the epidemic. And I have to butt in here. Uh, it's very important, Mr. Lutz. I'd like to know if on the Wayne County CIC, you're a board member of that. I'm not going to pretend that they signed this letter on your behalf, but because you are a member of the Wayne County CIC board, and uh, it signed this letter opposing the detox center, I would like to know also if Bobby Douglas ever spoke to the McComas family and told them that you were against the detox center. If we're all fighting on this together. I'm wondering if we're on the same page. I have copies of this letter that Sandra Hall sent to Mrs. Springer telling her not to sell the foreign nursing home to the detox center. The Wayne County CIC signed off on that letter. Mr. Lutz, you're a member of that board. Bobby Douglas, you signed off on that letter. I'd like to know if we are really on the same page. Anybody answer that question? Um, no. Because Kyle, you mentioned personal agenda at the last meeting. I'd like to know if there's another personal agenda going on here. If we're all in on this together, why are you opposed to a detox center? Wayne County CIC may have an opinion there, Mr. Lutz. I was not even, on a, I'm not even aware of that letter, so I can't speak to it. Sorry. One of the things I will say, only because I voted against the abatement for this, and um, I know that there was a lot of investigation. I don't know if you've done any investigation yourself with, with respect to the recovery center. But what we have learned is that um, best practices may not be used with that center. And we were concerned because we did not have enough information to know whether or not this was a good fit for the community. So I don't think that you can take just one letter and say that you have all the facts of people being on one page or on another page. There's a lot more to it, and I would be more than happy to talk to you about that after this meeting. Well, we should talk about it now in front of everybody. Well, I don't think that's the purpose hey, of this. Hey, guys, great. One thing I learned about working in public forums is that if there are the conflicts that you're raising or questions, they are better, best handled face to face. If I have a question about how you are, how I'm, how Kyle's behaving, how um, Ron over here is behaving. I want to pull him aside and talk to him individually. I think that is the more appropriate norm of, of a community group. I think if you want to keep things under the carpet, that's a good way of doing it. It's not about being under the carpet. It's about utilizing it's everyone's time effectively. All right, so going forward. I speak as public citizen. I think it should be open. 
and lay it out in there on the table as it is. Whatever's going on should be made public. Let's find an appropriate form. It's not the appropriate form. What's the appropriate form? City Council. City Council. Where it was, ah. in fact, fully ah. discussed. Ah. So, going forward on the agenda, we have the, uh, Bob Stokes, the CEO of Akron Communities uh, Health Center, and Jerry Craig, the Executive Director for the County of Summit Alcohol, Drug, and Addiction and Mental Health Services Board. And they're going to talk to us about uh, how they implemented QRT teams in Summit County. Um, they're also going to talk to us about how they, uh, how, they, how they are combating the opiate crisis up in Summit County. Right, and we decided we didn't want to do any PowerPoints or anything to board yet. We didn't want to throw those things up there. So we'd like this to be basically kind of informal presentation. If you have questions, feel free. I'm going to kind of turn things over to Jerry from the ADM board. And I've got a, a couple of different things that we're doing at Community Health Center. But Jerry is, uh, he's the group that's spearheading the quick response team. And we think that that's a really exciting um, way of getting out to the different communities. So I'm gonna, we'll start with him, he'll kick it to me and be cognizant of the time and kind of keep this within a half an hour for you guys. Okay, well, well thank you for inviting us. Um, what I thought would be most helpful is for me to give you a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of our local task force, how it originated and sort of the organic process that we, uh, that's taken us from the day that we first started that to today. So we convened in about 2014, early in 2014, and we just sent an email blast out to all of the community leaders and stakeholders that we could think of to invite them to our first meeting. We had 45 people at our first meeting. Um, we used that first meeting to do sort of an educational process, and then we established some um, key areas where we thought maybe it would be helpful for us to get started. Ask people to break up into these groups and develop long-term and short-term goals. And that's really how we sort of started things out. The first, uh, the first group that we started with was um, advocacy. So we knew we needed advocacy. Healthcare was a big, a, a big arena where there were certain issues and problems that we could tackle. Criminal justice and awareness um, was another piece. So we could educate the community, we could educate the healthcare uh, workforce, we could look at uh, advocacy and, and also try to do some interventions within each of those domains. Um, again, we, the first uh, goals that we established were to be accomplished within the first six months. And the second goal that they established, something they could accomplish within a year. And we were successful in doing that, and I think that was really what kept things going. Originally, we thought we would, we would meet monthly, but that got to be a little bit too onerous, especially with the number of people that were involved. So we gradually gravitated to a quarterly meeting, and then the subcommittees met on an as-needed basis to accomplish their goals, and then reported out at the quarterly meetings. Like I said, we started out in 2014 with 45 members. We've grown to over 400 people, and our meetings, our quarterly meetings usually garner about between 100 and 120 people. So we've got a lot of community investment, a lot of community interest. Um, our current committees, and some of the things that we've been able to accomplish through that is we have an advocacy and a legislative committee where we've actually got a quick response team for advocacy as well. So if we get, if we, there's a need for us to go to the legislature and advocate for something, we can put a team together, put some, put some testimony together, and we can go out and, and, and uh, testify on a very short turnaround time. We have, um, we facilitated the uh, organization of a statewide opiate task force <coughs> meeting in Columbus as part of the opiate uh, conference. So the first day was dedicated specifically to that. That was one of the long-term goals that we'd established in the second year of our opiate task force. Um, and that, we, I think we had over 900 people at that first day in that conference. Um, we also have been really effective in engaging our federal and local legislators. We have, you know, Marsha Fudge's office, uh, Senator, Senator Brown's office, uh, Representative Ryan, um, Senator Portman's office, send somebody. If they're not able to come themselves, they actually send somebody to be there and to, re and to respond to questions and concerns. On the state level, we have Amelia Sykes, 
uh, Frank LaRose, who also covers this district, and, uh, and Greta Johnson, who's been a very uh, vocal advocate for, for our issues. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a cross accountability. Sometimes what they'll tell us is, you gotta do a better job of advocating and having a voice in Columbus, but we also can then hold them, take them to task too. So it's been a really nice um, interchange between those two things. Um, through our healthcare uh, committee, we promoted the use of ambulatory detox and to develop that capacity within our agencies. Um, Bob's gonna talk a little bit potentially about their ambulatory detox for adolescents, which is one of the first ones in the state. We provide a lot of physician education uh, around prescribing practices and responsible prescribing practices. And have also instituted that in our medical school, Neomed Medical School, that feeds our system. Um, we try to do a better job of engaging dentists because dentists are really difficult to get to the table. Um, and we've also engaged our pharmacy, pharmacy school so that we could incorporate some of the practices around the use of the ORS reporting and some of those kinds of things into the uh, program. We also uh, initiated our first dawn clinic about uh, two and a half, three years ago. And one of the things that we've done as a result of the efforts of the Open Task Force is we take those dawn clinics now out into the community. We go to the drug courts, we go to the, um, the, the um, sober centers and places like that so that we actually uh, come to where people are rather than asking people to come to us because we found that we've been able to distribute more kits when we've done it that way. We have a family subcommittee now. That was something new that we added. And, and part of that was because last summer, as you remember, um, in Summit County, we had this uh, significant occurrence with carfentanil in our community. And as a result of that, uh, I had the opportunity to interact a lot with families and a lot of people had lost their loved ones as a result of addiction and overdoses. And um, what's really interesting is listening to their perspective and understanding how they touch our system and what their perception of the, our system is. And we've taken a lot of that feedback back in order to, for us to be able to make changes to our system that would help, um, would help uh, make it more, um, that would make it more uh, accessible to people. And that was where we came up with our addiction helpline. One number that people could, uh, could call six agencies that we could connect them to based on their availability of, of appointments, based on the um, issue that they presented to us, and, um, and so they have a choice, and, and uh, certainly we, we've, we've taken our system from 45 days to get somebody into an assessment to seven and a half days as a result of that, and that's been in two months. So that's something that we've accomplished just because we listened to families and made some changes to how people access our system. We also have a program that's based on this book, and I'll pass this around, and this is an extra copy, so if people would like it, it's called Silver, and it's, um, it's based on CRAF, which is a prevention, um, an intervention for families that, um, CRAF stands for, let me see if I can find my notes here, Community Reinforcement and Family Training. And it teaches families and um, friends effective strategies for helping their loved one to change and for feeling better themselves. So it's, it's about taking care of yourself when you've got a loved one who has an addiction, but it's also about how can we do effective interventions with them that's, that are going to be helpful. And you know, it's, it sort of uses some of the principles of Naranon, but also some of the principles of motivational interviewing. And, and so we're adapting that so that we can do family to family support, and we will also do it as part of a clinical model. Um, our criminal justice system, we instituted the distribution of Narcan kits by our first responders, um, our, our law enforcement agencies, and we went with the low-hanging fruit. We had the champions that took on that, and the ones that were sort of left behind, we shamed them, <laughs> essentially. Um, we had a lot of uh, resistance from Akron, for example, Akron, Public, or Akron Police, and so we were able to, once we had the lion's share of our agencies on board, we could publicly say, you're not doing this, um, we'd, like to, uh, we'd like to see that happen. And that came from our advocates, not necessarily from those of us who, who have to work with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and so that was really a cool way to, really a cool way to get, so, get change established. We established a mobile responder program that, per, that preceded our quick response team program where the first responders would contact the responder who would meet that individual experiencing an overdose in the emergency room, thinking this may be a teachable moment, we could um, help them get into treatment. We had very, um, very uh, 
mixed results from that. And so when we had the opportunity then to learn about a quick response team, and I gave you kind of a thumbnail sketch of it and a, and a one pager, quick response team essentially came from Foray Township, Ohio, outside Cincinnati. Um, essentially they take a law enforcement officer, a, a medic, and a, a counselor to go do outreach to people who recently experienced an overdose, usually within three to five days. And essentially what they do is they say, you know, we care about what's going on with you. We want to offer you the opportunity to do treatment. And this counselor could help you navigate our system. And, um, you know, we initiated that in January in um, uh, where we, uh, Chicago Falls. Again, one, they're always our champions starting things first. And we now have eight communities representing about 80% of our 2016 overdoses and about 75% of our community by population. Summit County is about 540,000 people, so you can see that would be a pretty substantial number of folks. Um, it hasn't been a real significant investment on our part, uh, probably under $100,000 for that responder. Um, and right now we're working within those communities, so as we add new communities on and it creates the opportunity for us to, to expand the program, uh, we're working with the local businesses and the, the philanthropic organizations to try to help support this in their communities because there's a cost savings. The outcome from the QRT is a 30% reduction in the cases in those communities, in the community where, where it originated, and the 80% success rate in getting people into treatment. So we're only in our second month. We're slowly adding communities on to this, so we really have our first, our first uh, group of, of communities only has about two months worth of data yet, so we don't really know how ours is doing relative to them, but we will be collecting data on that so we can measure that a little bit more effectively. Um, part of how we learned about the QRT was a Greg McNeil, who's a uh, member of our opiate task force who experienced the loss of a loved one as a result of uh, 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 an overdose. And he says, we thought we had it covered. We didn't have it covered. We want to find resources that exist in the community where people are doing good things. And then we can take those things to Summit County and we can try to implement them. So this was somebody who was not affiliated with us, not part of our system, who brought an idea to us, brought a bunch of people together in the community, and we were able to implement it. So um, that was something that, um, that we continue to do. We continue to look at best practices and things that we can implement within our community. One of the most significant things that we've done is we've developed a speakers bureau where we do educational events. We partner with the schools, we partner with the, uh, each of the different communities that we live in to um, educate people about opiates. Everything from how do we get there to what are the resources that are available and then the most, the question we get asked the most, what can I do? What can I do? It's on PQ Public. And we, we give them all of that information and then um, as, as we partnered, we partnered with churches, we partnered with um, businesses now, and we're getting the word out more and more. Our Speakers Bureau continually trains speakers. We can do anything from a five-minute elevator speech all the way to a two-hour presentation, and we have all the slides and things like that to, in order to be able to do that, and we can tailor it to the audience. Um, we also have added into this uh, youth committee. Um, and we've had, when we partnered with them to do things like in Barberton, they had a DECA program that did uh, an event. And it was an educational event for the community and also for the student body. And they did a drug take back day. Um, we had um, a group out of, uh, out of Community Health Center and Guidestone that put together public service announcements to be shown at the beginning of the, the films that are shown here at movie theaters. And that was a really cool partnership between our leadership Akron, our United Way, and, um, and our prevention agencies. So we're trying to do as much as we can to embed our services and practices. And also, we have our opiate task force meeting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon because we want kids to be able to come there after school. And, and so we're trying to do as much as we can to engage the community and use that, uh, the knowledge that we gain from the interactions with them in order to do things that are going to help this problem. because. Um, as you all know, there's not one simple solution. It's a whole variety of things that we're, that we're, that we're trying to do in order to combat this. I'm going to pass it off here. Yeah. So, um, 
Jerry had mentioned our adolescent program, and, and one of the reasons we were invited by Dan to come down here and talk is to kind of give you some ideas. So we're okay with you guys taking all these things, modifying them, because we know the needs out there. And Jerry had mentioned our adolescent program. Um, let me tell you one thing about Community Health Center. We own and operate a uh, methadone clinic in Southern County, which is Akron. We actually have over 600 daily dose folks that are on methadone or buprenorphine. Uh, you can imagine, we open up at 5.30 in the morning, and that place is absolutely packed from 5.30 until usually about 9.30 when we get a little bit of a break, and then by uh, noon to 1.30, we're just going the whole time. So if you don't think that there's that many folks that are impacted, then you really should look around because the numbers are frightening. And with an adolescent program, one of the things that we're trying to do and, and work with the ADM board is to prevent the next generation of people that suffer from addiction. So Community Health Center, we're a comprehensive program. We do all different type programs, but uh, in our adolescent program, we've treated upwards to 300 kids annually. Uh, in terms of our ambulatory detox program, uh, we actually bring in kids that are suffering from withdrawal. And a lot of times those kids may be, um, they may be missed or not correctly diagnosed uh, through the hospitals. And, and no offense to Worcester Community Hospital, but a lot of times um, they're seen as having flu-like symptoms. We can get those kids into treatment and even with casual opiate use, they can experience some significant withdrawal symptoms. And some of the things that we're actually doing for those kids, we bring them in and we use buprenorphine, suboxone. So we're actually using suboxone, which is uh, a tab versus, or is that strip versus a tab. Um, so we can get those off to the kids as well as Vivitrol. In our uh, adolescent program, we treated kids as young as 12 years old. They were twins and they were smoking marijuana daily. So we actually had to go back to my governing board and ask if we could treat kids that way. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of an amazing problem. Um, so not only do we bring kids in via uh, the ambulatory detox program, we have special rooms set up so we bring kids in, um, dose them with Suboxone, watch them, make sure they're doing okay, um, get them uh, back to their parents and get them back in the next day and again check on their symptoms, get them into IOP, which is an intensive outpatient. Those generally meet um, three times a week or about three hours, get those kids into those programs. Um, they tend to be group programs as well as individual counseling that we do. We also offer IHBT, intensive home-based therapy, and we're looking to expand that program where our counselors actually go out and meet with the kids in surroundings that are comfortable for them at home in schools, um, wherever they're more comfortable than actually coming to the office. One of the challenges we face with dealing with kids is timing. I mean, the kids have to go to school, so in order to get kids in, we have to have evening hours. Um, and we do that Monday through Thursday to be able to meet those schedules as well. Did you say you have a free methadone? It's not, uh, I said we own and operate methadone clinic. We, Right now, our funding for our methadone clinic is approximately 70% is via Medicaid. Is that the same as a detox center? No. So methadone treatment is medically assisted treatment. It can be methadone, it can be buprenorphine, it can be Vivitrol. And what that does is a replacement therapy. So a lot of people that actually can come in, dose on methadone, and after a certain period of compliance, they have a number of take-home doses. So it allows them to be treated for the disease of addiction and they can continue to hold their jobs, do it function daily. You might like to see this. Uh, our superintendent of our high school signed up on this letter not to have a detox center. The mayor did too, as well as our CEO of the hospital. Well, that's a good segue for schools for us. Okay, so um, one of the things that we're doing in schools actually is we actually have programs with counselors that go out and they're 
scheduled to be in different schools. We started this at uh, Snow High School. We're moving it to Green. Again, Snow is a very large suburb in, in the area of Akron. Um, we also are looking at Green, which is also a very large um, program, and we're getting support from the educators and people in the school to do that. We average only, we're putting counselors in one day in each one of the schools, and they're there for three hours, but even in that period of time, they're seeing three to four students that are coming in, so they can be referred. A lot of our referrals now that are coming in for ambulatory detox for our adolescent programs come from the court system. We have what's known as Restore Court, and that's for human trafficking, so we're getting a lot of um, adolescents do that, unfortunately, somewhere in the range of, I think we have 13 to 15 um, young folks that are in for that one. We also get uh, kids in from Summit County Juvenile Court, their intensive probation program. Um, so we're also uh, an active provider for that program as well. Uh, and we're fortunate in Akron that we have a lot of, of providers. Uh, generally, some of the stuff that we are specializing in substance use disorder addiction treatment. Um, for mental health, we'll also do co-occurring disorders. And we do have a psychiatrist that's available for um, one day a week. And then if they need additional follow-up, then we turn those folks out to have the child guidance or something. You know, some other agencies like that. So that's one of the programs. The other interesting one I wanted to share with you guys, we're actually looking to potentially do this for um, adolescents, because we've actually had adolescents that are 17 years old or so that we've gone with their parental permission, we've used um, Vivitrol on them successfully. But this is um, called a bridge device, and you're probably hearing a lot about this guy. I brought you the whole pack, show you what this thing looks like, and I'll pass it around. This is the device that that is put on behind the ear, and, and I think Governor um, Kasich had mentioned technology. We've actually done um, several patients with this, and this helps with detox. So what this allows to do is that there's no actual um, need for somebody potentially to go into an inpatient detox setting, that they can actually put this, this guy on. They, kind of, they, they can shower, but they have to cover it up. We tell them to put a shower cap on. Um, and what it does is provide <laughs> electric stimulation into the, uh, the nerve endings here and it helps very much with withdrawal symptoms. The one area it doesn't help with is GI. So, but our, we have a physician that does this, but they can control that through comfort medication, so it's Imodium. If they're having issues with that, they'll say, okay, we get you some Imodium to control that. Um, and once the device is on, it's comfortable with the individuals. You see dramatic results within generally, it's been our experience, uh, a little over half an hour that they start feeling dramatically better. And I know Bobby knows all about this because she saw this technology, I think it's probably the same time I did. We're getting ready to pilot it with that. Yeah, and, and locally. yeah. So I'm gonna pass this around. Be careful, there are, there are little probes here, they're kind of sharp, but this is how the dang on thing, it just fits on the ear. And I've got a little picture over there with, with uh, something that we sent out to basically our <laughs> employees so they can see one of the things that we're doing. The issues we have with uh, with getting people set up to do this, A, it's not covered by Medicaid, the cost. So we're basically covering the cost of the device. We're trying to get people in to see how the test pilot works on it. Um, it's timing for us. The person's supposed to come in right when they get this ball. So generally when we administer something like Suboxone or Buprenorphine, you're supposed to try to get those folks right as they're hitting. Um, that withdrawal period, sometimes it's difficult to do that with uh, with our clients. So it's supposed to be, it generally gets about 24 hours after they go. Excuse me, how does medical marijuana help somebody with opioid detox? To so your knowledge, medical marijuana. We, we're not using that. So Marinol's been out for an extended period of time. Marinol's been out for 10 years, <coughs> something like that. So that, that was basically for prescribed by physicians. So medical has to, Marinol is the, was the precursor of medical marijuana. So that's been out for a long time, but we don't have physicians at this point prescribing that. I understand, I think it's over by St. Thomas, we have like a walk-in clinic. 
where if somebody wants to walk in, they can. And I don't know how that's funded, but then also, too, if someone's revived with Narcan, are they presented with an option to go right into treatment rather than just let go? Or how do you handle people who've been revived? Well, two things. Um, the the, the uh, crisis center, we have a, a, a funded crisis center. One side of it is mental health, the other side of it is addiction. Um, we have a detox program there, it has 28 beds. We also have a drop-in center where people can go when they're um, you know, inebriated and need to sleep it off and they can do that safely. Um, so we have that on that side, and they can also then make referrals to treatment for people that are in that using our addiction help. The um, question about people who are, are administered Narcan, typically we're not gonna be able to get them into treatment immediately. It's interesting, some law enforcement agencies will transport to the hospital, others will not if there's an objection by the patient. So um, it's really kind of a hit or miss, and that was part of the reason why our responder program wasn't all that effective. But in those communities where we have quick response teams, our goal is to go out there within three to five days to offer them treatment, and then once we make contact with that person and they say they're interested in treatment, we can usually get them into treatment anywhere from one to seven and a half days. I have a question about the PRD. So how you have law enforcement, a counselor, and a, 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 paramedic. a paramedic, and that's, uh, and so that's not the full-time job. So they, right. they are, they just get the call, those three kinds of individuals, or is it always at least? So what three. happens, each community that's participating in this mm -hmm. designates uh, a volunteer, usually it's a volunteer police officer and an EMT. They schedule outreach visits, once a week, okay. and then okay. they'll go out and do, um, they'll look at their right. data from that previous week and try to find how they're gonna go. And they'll also go back and visit people who have to be and reach out to. And then each community budgets and pays for it. So every community so far has been willing to designate uh, a couple of, uh, okay. of outreach workers. Okay. The cost, the real cost of the program, of course, there's a cost associated with the, taking that officer offline to do the outreach but there's a cost to the, the, the mental health board through its agency. Uh, the detox centers are probably full. Sometimes they're full and sometimes they're not. You know, we have we have ambulatory detox in, in two different settings and we also have a presidential detox in um, We, and those are all, uh, Board funded. This none of those are none of them are Medicaid because they're so large. And, um, and that that program we generally uh, we just expanded by ten beds. We went from eighteen beds to twenty eight beds. And we, there are times when we can uh, get somebody in the same day or as soon as they call. And there's other times when we have to wait. Are you quietly? Then you said you don't take Medicaid. Well, these are board funded, and part of, part of the problem is because of the size of the facility, Medicaid, it's not eligible for Medicaid training. Do you find yourself taking people from your area to other detox centers, or vice versa, if you're overflowing? No, we have, we have, uh, we have the 20 beds um, at our crisis center. We also have at St. Thomas Hospital, um, the birthplace of AA. Um, I have to always put that plug in. <laughs> um, they, they also have a hospital-based detox program. And so between the two of us, we can usually manage those. Um, generally speaking, the, uh, the wait has been as long as 10 days. Since we've increased it, we've been able to reduce that wait. The worst case scenario has been four, four, hour, uh, four, four days. Do you have any expense? You said the police officer and the EMT are volunteering their time or just they're volunteers to, to be part of the program? Is they're that why there's an expense because they still have to be paid? Yes, okay. they still have to be paid. So they're voluntary participants and they, uh, they, they're not <laughs> offline essentially. In, in Colerain, I, I understood that it cost about $35,000 per year for the EMT and the, and the uh, uh, law enforcement officer. Um, as part of the you know overtime or that additional expense, so they don't take volunteers and pull them offline. They actually pay them separately for that service. What is uh, if this was days after an overdose has occurred, right? So what is the purpose of the EMT going along? Why why couldn't it be a counselor, an officer, for example? 
it's the it's the model. Simple, plain and simple. It's, it's the same people that it's the same people that respond to overdoses. So it's kind of it's an intervention that that um, allows the the person with the addiction to see that these folks are care about you, they're here for you. Um, it, it's also good for them. It's been something where we've gotten feedback from both the EMTs and the law enforcement officers that they get to actually see somebody who's doing well when they do get, in, get them into treatment and see something that's, you know, something different than so they know they're afraid, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> there, there's a cost associated with it, but I would say that, you know, if we could achieve, if we are able to achieve the same outcomes as they do in Colerain, it's well worth the investment. One of the things he's not mentioned is, but he had told me anecdotally, is that they've had people go to the house where they've been able to get a two for one. So the person that was actually had overdose, there's somebody that's an enabler that's also dosing as well, actually gets into treatment. So there's there's benefits to the program as well that we haven't even realized yet. I would imagine, I would imagine the family too, they potentially could intervene with the family. Yeah, connected. And we give them these, this, this is a resource <coughs> so that they know what's available. It has messages of hope in it, it has resources for families, and it also tells people how to get into treatment fairly, fairly easily. Um, and this is part of our, our big campaign as we as we've tried to introduce the addiction helpline. Um, it's, it's been a, a nice way to get people into the system and, and let them know that we're, as you can see from the, from the boxing gloves and the, the our, our, uh, our campaign, it's we've got your back and we're, as a community, we're going to help you. If um, we have to start smaller because we don't have the resources to pay for all three, sure. is the, does the model recommend against only sending an officer and a counselor or not? I mean, I, just realistically and practically, I'm just thinking how we could get this off the ground at lesser expense. We, we embraced the model as it was presented by Coleraine. We've not played with the model at all. You know, we've had um, requests for media to ride along, and we said no. You know, we can't. We'll, Don't do there, that. There, there'll be time for, for that sort of thing, but we've really tried to stay as close to the model as possible because it's already proven to be successful. Uh, if we start monkeying around with it, we, you know, we could potentially un undermine our, our uh, outcomes. How was the, how are they receiving it? I, mean, I was over in Mansfield that there they had a. Um, Opiates being there, they invited me to come over and think they were presented to share with them. But they brought this up to the sponsors, and uh, they had just started it, and um, some of them were kind of very hesitant to an officer, you know, come up, you know, are you finding any resistance to it? It's really interesting. It's different in every community. So, for example, we do it in Cargo Falls. Cargo Falls has been. Um, their, their mayor and their safety forces have been very out there in the community about the problem with drugs and they had a lot of programs and things. And they announced it well ahead of time. And when they first went out, uh, family said, well, we were waiting for you. We knew you were coming. <laughs> that was really cool. Then we had, then we went out to Barberton and we had folks that, you know, they would come out and visit. And, the law enforcement officer and the, the team would be at the front door and the person would be going out the back. <laughs> so, uh, How's that for honest? Yeah. <laughs> but as, you know, as people get used to this, as they start to see it, as they start to understand what it's all about, we start to see their uh, warming to this. And, and uh, it's been a really good thing in our communities. It's, it's, again, it, it makes the communities feel as though they're doing something to impact this problem. I think that's really significant. Jerry, where are your clinics located? Out in the city proper, suburbs, out in the country, would you say? Well, we're not real rural, um, but our, a lot of our, we have programs in different parts of the community. So we have six, six agencies that the ADM board funds and other three agencies that are not funded by us, and we are also folding them into our addiction helpline. So we can give people choices based on where they live, um, where, you know, here's the closest program that has an opening this week, and you can choose that or you can go across town and get an appointment tomorrow. So it's, it's all about giving that person the choice between a range of options and then letting them choose. But primarily your detox clinic would be, would you say, in the city proper? Yes, our detox clinic is downtown. Amazing. 
Any fears? I feel like I'm being let down the garden. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, uh, backing up a bit, sure. the, the, the task group itself, that you had some, uh, some interventions and some general efforts. How were those funded? Through grants, through donations? Well, we fund our opiate task force. The ADM board funds the opiate task force at about $50,000 a year. Um, and so that maintains our website. It maintains a lot of our publications and things like that. But then there are also some things that our board does anyways for, for um, community relations and other things. So we try to fold those things together when it makes sense to do so. Mm -hmm. um, we have partnered with um, a lot of businesses in our community to help support some of our initiatives. Um, we have Mountain Crop Pharmaceuticals provided these Deterra bags. These are medication disposal bags. They're activated charcoal. You put your opiate medication in here. You put some water in it. You seal it, shake it up, and it essentially goes in the trash. Disables your medications. Mm -hmm. You throw it in the trash. It's biodegradable. It's safe. You pass this around. You can take a look at it. These are great, by the way. Yeah. Any, any, oh, it can be liquid. <laughs> Do you have a central coordinator or someone that coordinates your task force? <laughs> you know, it's, really, it's really a team effort. And, and we have a, a steering committee, <coughs> subcommittee chairs, and then, but most of this is driven by the board. We want to make sure that things stay in motion and that we, um, you know, we support that uh, logistically and, and operationally. Question may be too difficult to answer. But you're using several different modalities for treatment. Are you finding one in general more effective than others? Like is Vivitrol more effective than Suboxone? Or?
I have a question. If, if, a, if a patient overdoses and ends up in your uh, in a hospital <coughs> emergency room, d does your hospital or any uh, emergency rooms have any sort of a role or responsibility with the mobile task force? In other words, do the hospitals call these resource officers? Um, Part of the struggle that we've had is with the hospitals sharing information about people who come to the emergency departments. Okay. Some have been more cooperative with that than others in the interest of continuity of care and getting people to do the right thing. Sometimes I think that, editorial comment, sometimes I think their legal departments um, try to think of ways to save them from potential liability and that's not necessarily thinking about the larger picture. So a lot of times it's just getting them through legal, getting those decisions through legal is so onerous that they don't even want to entertain the, the conversation. Darn so, lawyers. So we <laughs> and, and HIPAA and, and 42 CFR are huge, um, due to huge barriers. Um, and you know, what we try to do is, is develop informal relationships with them and referral relationships so that where they do encounter some of these, these detoxing and, and understand too, the patient has to consent to that. So Jerry's team could go in there and be waiting to see the patient, and the patient can say, I feel much better now, after they've been hit with the Narcan, and say, look, uh, I don't want to see him. So, and that's patient choice. In your experience, when that does happen, do patients tend to go towards, I don't want to talk to them, or do they are more open to like a response team showing up? Well, you know, Narcan throws people into a withdrawal, and what they're thinking about is how can I get relief from this withdrawal syndrome. And so they're often not very interested in talking to them. They want to go out in the streets and get reconnected to what, what's going to give them relief. And, you know, we have to acknowledge that. I mean, that's just, that's the reality of the world that we live in. And so um, oftentimes it's easier for us to do an intervention with somebody when they're, um, when they're more comfortable physically. Have your clinics ever come across any negativity from, from the residents surrounding your clinics? Have your clients ever found themselves in hostile environments because the residents weren't supportive of your clinic being there? or maybe being harassed by police because your elected officials didn't like you being there. This was brought to my attention by somebody who had uh, been speaking with a heroin addict who was concerned if they could get themselves into a detox unit, how would the community or the police, not wanting them, them there to begin with, treat them? Uh, has that ever come across your radar? Not, not no. You know, I, I think our, our uh, law enforcement is pretty benevolent to the population. Around our um, detox center, um, we have some community organizations, and a lot of those community organizations will befriend those folks and invite them in. Um, you know, it's, it's really pretty amazing to watch the, the community has really been more receptive than I would have, would have uh, imagined. Now, we've had this program there for 20 years. And, you know, we started off, most of the people that went to those programs were neighbors. You know, they had uh, alcohol, uh, alcohol involvement, um, getting into more of the, the stronger drugs, meaning detox has, has been, uh, this has been relatively new, you know, something that we've seen over the past 10 years gradually increase. And I can speak for Community Health Center with our uh, medically assisted treatment center. We've been, we've been around since 1974, so we've been around a long time as well. But we get the exact opposite. The, the criminal justice, the police support us. If, if we hear that somebody, we have dealers out in the parking lot, then we'll ask them, if they're, and they're doing it real early or whatever, they're doing it late, we'll ask the police to drive through and check. And they're, they're 